Well, it's summer, it's been beautiful weather, and it's also the time where we try different things in our messages. And I thought, hey, this is a great week for me to try out something different because it's going to be August long weekend and nobody's going to show up, and then you did. Well, we're going to try something anyway. Um, And I'm really actually looking forward to it, and over the next three weeks, I'm going to practice this and see if this is something that works well. It's called Kahoot. So if you have your phones here, you can take part in this. And I'll be having a quiz this week, and each week I'll try something different. And what you need to go to on your phone is Kahoot It. That's K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T. Okay? And then when you get there, there will be a code. Where's the code at? Please come and work. That's where this scary thing. Oh, there we go. Okay, so if you're at Kahoot It... And those online, I know you're going to be five to seven seconds behind. So if you, some of you who win this, that's online, I will be so impressed, right? Okay, so the way this is going to work is as you're getting on there, you're going to write in, you know, Kahoot, oh, the cameraman, you see, and you're going to put your names up and it's going to show and we can have up to 100 people stay, take part of this. There's going to be five questions that we're going to go through. And the faster you answer it correctly, the more points you get. And at the end... We're going to see who's the smartest people in this congregation. Now, I want to make sure it's clear. The questions that I'm asking, they're not just something that I thought up. These, I researched them. Some of them come from National Geographic. Others come from uh, uh, other reputable websites like Britannica.com and such. So these are their ideas and not mine, and some of them are a little bit up for debate, and some of them are going to be a little bit of a trick question, so just giving you a heads up for that. Oh, look at that. We got, we got it pretty good. So I'm going to give you five to six more seconds more. Oh, Kahoot it. IT. Uh, yes, it's okay. To use. So, so it says Kahoot, say, see that? Kahoot IT, and then you put that number in. Oh, awesome. Wow, we got 33 people, 34. Fantastic. Yes, yeah, and then once it says, I'll come down and look. Just a second. So, we're going to go through the first questions, and you're going to get shapes that you're going to go with it, and you'll put it down. And here's the first. So, you guys ready? First question. Okay. Oh, it just went, sorry. The oldest man made structure Gobi Tepe, Acropolis in Athens, Stonehenge, Great Pyramid of Giza. So if you don't know where those places are, Gobi Tepe is in Turkey, the Acropolis is in Greece, Stonehenge is in England. We drove past that general area and we didn't stop. What was I thinking? And the Great Pyramid of Giza. It's Gobi Tap. So, excellent. Good job. Oh, look. Who's PK number two? Wave at us. <laughs> oh, Bethany. You know what? I shouldn't have told her she's not allowed in this. She's going to know all these answers. Oh, man. Oldest city. Oldest city. There's a little bit easier one. Babylon. Jericho. Jerusalem. London, England. So Babylon, Iraq, Jericho, Israel, Jerusalem, Israel, London, England. It is Jericho. Ha <laughs> I knew I'd get some of you a trick with the, with the Babylon one. I knew you'd think because that was the greatest city at one point. Excellent. Okay. Bethany. Okay. <laughs> Oldest act of constitution. So act of constitution, that this means like this is the constitution they still run their country on. Okay, so oldest act of constitution. England, Italy, China, San Marino. Okay? Oldest act of constitution. So they still have the same constitution. San Marino. China is actually the newest on there, 1949. I said constitution. Do you see what I did there? Okay, awesome. Thank you. Okay. 
Oldest act of business. I liked this one. This was a good one. Okay. Hof Winery, Germany. Gumi Construction, Japan. Trinity Lighthouses, England. Schiff's Restaurant, Austria. They make great sausage, apparently. I wish I could go. Three, two, one. Gumi Construction. They have been around since... Uh, 578. Can you believe that? I wonder if they have any buildings as old as their construction. Okay, last one, last one. Expected to last the longest. This is a man-made item. This is according to National Geographic. They had a great series. Nuclear waste, bronze statue, stainless steel frying pan, or Twinkie. Okay, this is National Geographic. This is their, their, they had a great show on if all the people disappeared, what will remain on earth? Because then space is a different matter. It was a stainless steel frying pan. You would think it was nuclear waste, right? Stainless steel frying pan. Those who are those who watched that series, aren't you, that got the stainless steel frying pan. So when, now just remember this. Next time you buy stainless steel cookingware, that is a 25 to 40 million year investment. <laughs> of course, if it's like not like fall down some fault line or it gets melted. We're just talking like it sat in a desert, you know, up on a hill or something like that. Okay, thank you. Awesome. So let's see who won. Who's Baron? Oh, look at that. Oh, online genius. Who's number two? Online genius. Aha. So we got a family going on. And Bob. Who's Bob? Oh, my. This. Okay, they, they were cheating, I bet, right? No, I'm joking. They were. Way to go, guys. Good job. Give them a round of applause. Okay. Well, this week we're talking about the character trait that is rarely talked about. God is eternal. God has always been. Um, the uncaused cause. According to the laws of physics, there is nothing in the universe that is uncaused. Everything is has a cause. You and I have a cause. We're caused by our parents, who are caused by their parents, and on it goes. Every single one of us, one of those things mentioned in the Kahoot a few moments ago, was caused by people. But we make some audacious claims about God. We say that God is eternal. He is the uncaused cause that causes things. Hey, that's a mouth tongue twister, isn't it? And he has always been and how and why do we make this claim? Because it is the only, ob, uh, only logical explanation for reality. But here's a more audacious claim that we make as Christians. We claim that Jesus, who claims to be God himself, is the uncaused cause as well, that he is eternal. There are literally so many scripture verses that I could have gone through this morning, it was actually really hard to narrow them down. I'm going to invite Trent to come up to read the first two are really those, ah, oh, wow. And the last two are really the, so now what? But I could have had dozens for these scripture readings. Isaiah 40, verses 28 to 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Revelation 22, verses 12 and 13. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Job 26, verses 22 to 26. God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Who has prescribed his ways for him or said to him, You have done wrong. Remember to extol his work, which people have praised in song. All humanity has seen it. Mortals gaze on it from afar. How great is God, beyond our understanding. 
the numbers of his years is past finding out. And 1 Timothy 1, verses 15 to 17. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Trent. God is eternal. According to the best scientific minds today, they believe the universe is 13.7 billion years old, give or take a few years. Although that is up for debate, just last week, a group of scientists led by the Ottawa, University of Ottawa professors, which is the best astronomy school in Canada, that's one of my dreams, to take an astronomy course at the University of Ottawa someday, because I love astronomy, just put out evidence why they think the universe is 26.7 billion years old, give or take a few years. So, the age of the universe is up for debate, but it's old. What isn't up for debate is that the universe had a start, which means it has a cause. And that means that God is outside of the universe because we say he's the uncaused cause. He's outside of time. Now, back to the universe being a set date, a really old set date at this point, really old, but that was not the view that was held by the majority of great thinkers until actually a fairly recent consensus. Let's take a step back and think about what the worldviews that have been held by people before us, most specifically by most people when Scripture is being read, what they held to. Polytheism is the belief that there are a whole bunch of small g gods, and they all believe that the universe was eternal. It lasted forever. It had no beginning. Um, but here's how they dealt with it. Most of the small g gods worshipped had a small part to play in the current universe. For the Greek gods, which were the same as the Roman gods, just different names, the current gods overthrew the previous gods, and those current gods overthrew those previous gods, and it goes back three generations, and then they lose track because it wasn't written down. But the Hindu religion which actually has an incredible amount of similarities to that, claims that they have a record going back 155 trillion years of every 4.3 million years, the world is destroyed and then recreated. Who's seen the movie Oppenheimer? If you haven't, I highly recommend it. Heather and I went last night. It was awesome. When have I seen a movie in the theaters that's actually story-driven? Isn't that amazing? It was a great movie, and it's this true story about how the nuclear bomb came into being and, and the wrestlings and the existential crisis of, of creating power like this. And Oppenheimer is known really well for this quote that he makes. Now I, am, now I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. And he's quoting the holy scriptures of the Hindus, which is part of the cycling and recycling, the 4.3 million year cycle, and that he was like, I'm part of this destruction and then recreation? Well, when Oppenheimer made the atomic bomb, at that time, almost all scientists in the secular world believed that the universe was eternal without a creator. That was the overwhelmingly accepted view until the late 1950s. Matter of fact, even into the 80s, when I started reading astronomy uh, textbooks, yes, I'm a geek, at five years old, my parents asked me what I wanted for my birthday, and I wanted a great big astronomy textbook that I saw at the bookstore when we were on holidays in the U.S. And they're like, no, you don't. And I'm like, yes, I do. And they bought it for me. It's like this thick, and I completely wore it out. So at 10 years old, I bought a second copy of it with my own money, and I completely wore it out. And then I found one at a garage sale, and I put that in the shelf. That was a few years ago. Even in the 80s, in my textbook that I read and reread and reread, 
the debate was still there. Is the universe eternal or does the universe have a beginning? Well, even then, but that's generally now overwhelmingly accepted. Why? Because of philosophy. Now, this is where it's a completely unusual sermon for me. You know that I love to go through, and, and, and because the, the word of God is, is so powerful, and why I like to go through an individual book, one book at a time. In this series this summer, we're going through character traits of God, where I'm taking philosophy, and I'm taking individual passages that line up with my philosophy, and I feel completely out of place. But this is one of the things that I'm passionate about, and this is one of the things that actually I get to talk to other people when I'm doing my other job with Global Vision 2020 that they want to sit down and have a conversation over while in the evening after we handed out glasses with professors. So these are some of the things that I pour myself into reading, but I've never, ever done a sermon in this way. So I'm completely feeling like I'm a little bit overwhelmed. But here's what I want to get into and say, philosophy gets too quickly of a bad rap in the church. Let me read to you what Philosophy is, in Webster's Dictionary, it is the study of the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence, especially when considered, when considered as an academic discipline. Now, one of the dangers that we've had in philosophy in our church and our schools that, is that we take philosophy and we deconstruct our worldview which actually is a good thing to pull things apart and say, how does this work? But we don't reconstruct it. And actually, one of my goals that I have as a pastor is to actually help people reconstruct their worldview more than deconstruct, because they're already getting it deconstructed everywhere. And I want to encourage you that in a faith journey, philosophy can help you reconstruct your faith. Let me tell you about how it's constructed my faith. In everyday language, this is the pursuit of understanding reality and existence using logic and reason. So let me talk to you about how the basic worldview that almost all scientists hold today, that creation has a creation event, which the majority believe that there is a creator. Now, that creator to them is distant. I'll talk about that in our show, now what? Of who is Jesus? But the majority feel this way because of an astronomer named Vladimir, who was a Jesuit priest. He came up in 1931 with this logical reason, that there had to be a starting point of the universe. And because of his logic and reason that there had to be a starting point in the universe, he came to the conclusion that there must be measurable things that we can use modern-day instruments and measure and say, look, we can go back to the caused, cause cause, cause, till there's the beginning. And what was that hypothesis? Was that there would be, the universe would be expanding. And modern day telescopes, radio telescopes, which were brand new in 1931. And and infrared telescopes, which if you heard about the James Webb telescope, that's the best, the most amazing telescope ever made. And it sees in the infrared, which allows them to see further back in time than any other telescope. Those all came from Latimer saying, hey, if we had these instruments, we would be able to see these things. And it turns out that every single one of the things that he came up with as measurable evidences of the universe having a beginning, which later became known as the Big Bang. By the way, the Big Bang was the name that they gave to mock it. Get that. The Big Bang was the name that his detractors gave to mock his idea. Just sort of like Yankee is the name that the British gave to the Americans to mock them. And they're like, hey, yeah, that's pretty good. That tells me another thing of a philosopher that's good. You get mocked by something, maybe sometimes turn around and embrace it. Because now we remember this term, Big Bang, that was done as a mock, and it was shown to be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. Where did love... Labmetir's original hypothesis come from? Well, it came from, first and foremost, he said, by following Paul. Paul at Athens, Mars Hill. Apollos, who was known as the second generation of the great debaters. It was in the second century that so much of the ideas of debating with the Greek and the uh, secular scholars came into being. 
Now let's move away from the more detailed philosophy at this point. Let's talk about our so now what today. What are the questions that you get asked? What are the questions that I get asked when I'm sitting with a bunch of people who are talking about the existential question of reality? One of the questions that almost always comes up is, so who created God? The quick and easy answer is that God doesn't have a creator, that he's just always been. But that simple explanation doesn't sit well with skeptics. And I can accept that. So what should we say? Well, here's some of the stuff that I talk to some of my friends or university professors when we sit at the table with each other. I get this from guys like Hugh Ross, um, Reasons to Believe, other much greater scholars, um, Lee Strobel. So here's what I do when they ask me that as we're sitting at a table and we're asking, so who created God? I forgot to bring a pencil up. I was going to use pencil as an illustration, as a prop. I'll say, well, here's an example. You are correct in your starting point in saying, I agree with you, that everything has to have a cause. I mean, we all know this pencil that we have, it didn't just show up poof into existence. Where did it come from? Well, it first had to come from a truck that delivered it to the dollar store, and we go backwards from the truck, it came on a cargo ship, probably from China, in the factory, but in the factory, it would have had to have gone to the tree and the graphite, China actually mines 80% of the graphite in the world, so that's why almost all the pencils come from there, not just because of manufacturing, because that's where the stuff comes from. So we've got the wood, and then we've got the graphite. Where did all, all that stuff come from? Well, if we go far enough back, it, the elements that it's created from were probably created in the heart of a star that blew up a really long time ago. And, and if it's graphite, that, that might be different stuff than the metal part, the iron, that come from a different star that blew up. So we might end up with three different stars that blew up to get this pencil. And now you got back to the Big Bang. So you're right in thinking that. But here's what Psalms 90 Verse 2, who had no inkling of any of these things in advance. How they had no scientific inclinations. The Bible already said there has to be an uncaused cause. can only come from outside. Before the mountains were born, you brought forth the whole world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The Bible describes God as a being who has always been and always will be. Hebrews 3 verse 4 states, every house is built by someone. But he who builds all things is God, indicating that God is not constrained by the law of cause and effect our houses are. Rather, he is the chief builder, the uncaused cause, is the beginning, the being who initially set all things into motion. And then we talk about how perfectly everything is built in the universe, that, that one small change at the moment that the Big Bang happened, nothing could have condensed into the matter that we have. And the logical conclusion at the very end of it is, there must be a creator that's set into motion. Now, by the way, the one way out of that, but it's not really a way out of that, is, well, actually there's infinite universes. Now, what's your evidence for that? Well, I got none. Because I can't have any, and I never will have anybody, any, because we can't test what's outside of the universe. So, that's my answer. But, but, we, but that's going against scientific principle. And that's where we start off with. This goes back to, as I said, all the great Christian philosophers, men like Thomas Aquinas, who in the 1100s really brought this all into being. Lee Strobel says, the point stands, the law of cause and effect supports the creation model, not the atheistic evolutionary model. Now I promise, that is the end of philosophy this morning. But if you like philosophy... And I do. And I know there are people here that do. We're going to be starting Alpha in fall, in September, right after our kickoff. And there are going to be some great philosophical discussions and debates that happen in that class. I love Alpha because it allows you to wrestle through these questions, these existential questions. Who created God? Why do I exist? Why does the universe exist? And those are awesome to sit in and be safe in. Because here's what I want to say to you. You can be safe with holding any of these views, wrestling that with that in our church. But I take my firm grounding of a constructed faith based on that God is eternal. 
Now, so now what? I got five minutes for that. The Bible says we're created in God's image. Last week, or two weeks ago, I said that God is creative, and we're made in God's image, and when we are created to be creative. And when we are being creative ourselves, we are just acting out being made in God's image, which in of itself is an actual worship of God. This week, I want to say that when God created humanity, the only part of creation that he created in his own image, he created us eternal as well. Yes, you and I were created for eternity. Scripture teaches us that we are three parts, body, mind, and soul, which isn't a surprise when you think about that. Who is God? Three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those things go beyond our mind. I can't comprehend them, but I know they're true. Our soul and spirit is eternal. And yes, our mind. Our mind is eternal. Who you are will not simply disappear in the midst of time because you are created in God's image and you are created for eternity. Now, our bodies, as we know, and as I walked along a number of families this week, as family members passed away, we know these bodies are not eternal. When I was in my early 30s, I could run fast. Now I'm so slow. And I just keep getting slower. It's breaking down this body. And we all know that eventually, on this side of heaven, we will all pass away and we will go back to being dirt in the ground because that's where all the atoms and molecules that we're made up of come out of. Where does it say that? In Scripture. And it's true. But even our bodies will be resurrected and made eternal because that's actually how Scripture in Revelation, the passage that we read before, says it will be. Jesus, after he conquered death, he rose again and he has a perfect body. The first fruit, the first new Adam. Even our bodies will be made eternal again. All those other things that we talked about before that were man-made, they're all going to fade away, those things we made. But you and I, you and I, you look around, all of us are created for eternity. So now, what is the most important thing in our lives? That's a rhetorical question. It's people, of course. But because of the fall, sin entered into creation, and things that are less important are put over things that are more important. That is actually one of the most important definitions of sin. Sin is putting things in the wrong order. Money is not evil. Stainless steel cookware is not evil. But that's not what we put in order above people. People, relationships. Paul understood this when he wrote 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 to 17, we read a few moments ago. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners whom I am the worst. But for the very reason I have shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his immense patience as an example for those who believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, and the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. That's how Paul starts off his letter to his mentee, Timothy. So what can we learn from that? There's so much in just that passage. Patience. Patience with each other. When I sit down with a friend who I've made through, through my work together, and I don't know where they're at with their faith walk, patience with them. I don't, I don't need them to accept what I taught them right off the bat. As a matter of fact, they might poke holes in what I have to say because I'm not that smart. But patience with them and myself as we walk along in a journey together. Also humility to see that, you know what? I'm not that smart. And God is still using me anyway. And that's pretty amazing. Another scene in Oppenheimer that I saw yesterday that I really, really appreciated Oppenheimer, when they had a newborn baby, all things were going crazy and chaos in their family, and, and they didn't know how to stop this baby from crying. And he drove across town to his best friend's house and said, can you please take the baby for time? Not right now, but for, for, for a few weeks. 
And he said, well, yes, we can do that. He says, and he says, but what's going on? He says, we're terrible people. He was talking about him and his wife. And they had a drinking problem. And they thought they were really smarter than everyone else. He says, we're terrible people. And I'll never forget this thing that his friend, who was a counselor, said to him. He says, truly terrible people don't know they're terrible. Let me say that again. Truly terrible people don't know they're terrible. And Oh, the acting was so good. You could just see him like just catch his breath. That's the type of salt and light that we need to be. And that's the type of salt and light that Timothy, that Paul was to Timothy. And what do we want to show? Incredible patience, just like God has shown patience with us. So that the immortal king, invisible, the only God, will be given glory, honor forever. And ever. I want to conclude to you by reading again Job. There's so much in Job. Like, I could just sit there and read and read and read Job in this area. I want to conclude by reading Job chapter 36, verses 22 and following. I'll invite the worship team to come up as I'm reading. God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Who has prescribed his ways for him or said to him, You have done wrong? Remember to extol his work, which you have praised in song. All of humanity has seen it. Mortals gaze on it afar. How great is our God beyond our understanding. The number of his years is past finding out. Leave in awe of the God who is eternal.